What is up, race fans? It's February 2019, and you're talking dirty with Jake. I'm your host, Jake. Okay, so uh, let's keep this brief because today's guest is a doozy. Uh, We're talking with Tim Pitts, track announcer at OCFS for over 30 years. Um, This guy's a a legend, and uh, we talked for quite a while, so I don't want to take up too much time at the top of the show. Obviously, big news this week. uh, Purse structures for 2019 have been released. Uh, It's big (laughs) news. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. You've seen them at this point, and uh, I think you're all as excited as I am to get going here now is really all that there is to say. Why don't we just get right to it? Uh, Our interview is taking place in Tim's shop, which you'll hear some shop noises, I think, throughout the recording. But also, we were recording amidst a wild windstorm. Oops, sorry, I'm not supposed to curse on this. We were... uh, we were, it was crazy. Anyway, you could you can hear the whistling in the background. It's it's pretty intense. So here we are. We're in Pennsylvania today. We're in Tim Pitt's garage. Tim, how's it going? Bob, uh, good actually. It's uh, typical midwinter stuff happening right now in my life, but uh, things are going well. And uh, as they always say, it can always be worse. So hey, we're happy. Yeah, you won't. You probably won't be able to hear it through the mic, but we're experiencing some intense uh, windstorms in the Northeast right now, and uh, we, you know, we may or may not lose power throughout this recording. We so we're going to soldier through, and hopefully nothing happens. Got four flashlights in hand, just in case. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make do. So Tim, uh, 2019, 100th anniversary. Uh, the big talk right now is uh, obviously centered around the $100,000 payout for the Centennial Race Weekend and the weekly purse of $3,300. Uh, who, do you, who do you see coming back this year, slash who do you want to see at Orange County? Who have you been missing, and, and what are the odds that they'll actually come back? Well, we, we won't know really until the season begins who we're actually going to get back. I mean, you know, we go back to the heyday, uh, back into the 80s, when a lot of those drivers are still around. We're talking about the classic showdown. Every Saturday night at Middletown was the Brett and Danny show. You know, you love them, you hate them. And everybody in the grandstands either loved or hated that, that setup. Uh, we'd love to see that, that happen. And I'm hoping that's a possibility. Yeah, so this so. Uh, obviously has only been speculation at this point because neither Brett or Danny have announced anything. Uh, yeah. But we're, uh, we're, we're hopeful that that could happen. Well, we're hearing the possibility about the Timmy Heinley coming back. And I'll tell you what, if there's a track where Timmy Heinley can make some time on, it is Middletown. He can do, the, he can do the job there. So you put him up with guys that we already have at our disposal, like Jerry and, and, and of course, Tommy Meyer and those guys, this could be the best of the best ever. I would really like to see. We've got a, a great group of small block drivers down here in Pennsylvania that are second to none. Guys that have had limited track time at Middletown, but I'm talking guys like Jeff Strunk and, and Craig Von Duren and Dwayne Howard. They've had some runs at Middletown. They've had limited success at Middletown. But you watch these guys down here in Pennsylvania on a small block track. I mean, they are the big block heroes of the small block country down here. I'd love to see them make uh, make a couple of ventures to Middletown on a Saturday night. Well, at two thousand to win on a Saturday night, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking we uh, we might be able to get a couple of those guys to come out. Yeah, the small block purse looks healthy. And, yeah, you know, guys even like Strunk and Von Doren could certainly put a big block together. Also, boy, yeah. it would be it would be worth their while because. Uh, Typically down here in Pennsylvania, our small block purses are half decent, but they still won't venture up to what they can make at Middletown on a Saturday night. Yeah, yeah, I would think, especially for our special events, we would see uh, sure. we would see at least a few of those guys come out. Uh, certainly for the hundredth weekend. Well, here too is where the short track super series has certainly been been kind to of Middletown because we've had some different drivers come to Middletown with Brett Deo shows that never had big track experience, never had New York experience. Right. They love the place. I mean, look at the last short track super series show. No, no, no clue that we'd ever have uh, the winner come out of Pennsylvania like that and never have really experience on a big track. Yeah. So I'm hoping that uh, that Brett shows really generate a lot of additional interest in Middletown as well. Yeah. What about big names like Matt Shepard? Do you think this is? Uh, do you think this could be his year? I mean, whether or not he comes w- racing with us weekly, I don't think it's a possibility. But he'll definitely be there for big shows, and uh, you know, you know, he's still chasing that win. All the big guys from yeah. upstate should pay attention to what's happening because. 
you know, they run maybe close to home upstate, but no way are they going to be able to take home a paycheck like they will. You know, you're talking, you know, Super Matt, and of course, you know, Stewie will be down when he can as well, as well as his race schedule permits. But all those guys, you know, uh, Coffee and Ward and, and, and the Gypsum team and everybody from up north ought to really take the, the venture on down. Uh, the neat part about it is, of course, you're going to have the best of the best paying attention to Middletown this year. They'll be coming down and running with Orange County regulars who know the track, who've been there every Saturday night for how many years. They know the ins and outs of that speedway. So those guys really are not going to be taking a back seat right. in any way, shape, or form. We know Orange County regulars take a back seat to the yeah, and we know guys. and we know at least from eastern states that Orange County regulars tend to perform sure. better than uh, yeah. outside invaders. You know, so it's the question is is which of these guys can commit to a full schedule at Orange County to get that time in to, to get you know to actually have a shot at that hundred thousand dollars. I think we'll see some surprises, and then of course the news that just broke recently too about the. The weekly com- uh, campaigner bonus, so it's not just a hundred thousand. If that's right. a weekly campaigner, according to the, the new statute, they can walk off with a hundred and ten thousand. Right. That's that's more than most guys make <laughs> in a career. Come on, let's face it. You know, to walk out of there with one night, and you know, it, it's not just going to be the best man is going to win. You have surprises. You have upsets. You have spur of the moment things oh, yeah. that happen on dirt track that won't even happen on asphalt. You don't see this stuff on Sunday on TV. You know, you turn no, you on your not. TV on Sunday, you know there's about five drivers you're going to be looking at in victory lane. That doesn't happen in Middletown. Yeah. Anything can happen. And it, it, it's, I think it's going to be a shocker. Uh, you look at, 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 of course, Brett, the winningest driver at the Speedway. But in the last couple of years, we've seen some guys rise up to Brett's level. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not a 200 lapper. It's a 160 lapper. Right. Now, Brett, Brett outperforms in a 200 lapper. He's right. got that down pat. That's, that's on the palm of his hand. It's 160. That's a whole different strategy. It's a different tire strategy, fuel strategy. It's not October. Right. <laughs> it's going to be wild. Right. It's, it's going to be, be wild. We're talking seriously different, uh, you know, climate conditions in, sure. in mid-August than sure. we are at Eastern States. That's going to be great. It's going to it's certainly going to play a big part in track conditions and, and tire wear. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be a race like we've never seen. <laughs> and we'll never see again. I mean, right, this, is, yeah, that's, this is something we've got to take advantage of. Right, exactly. This is, it's not something to miss. I mean, yeah. you only turn 100 once, and uh, we're doing it big. Yeah, well, I, I think already we've turned a lot of race fans' heads that, A, maybe used to be regulars and haven't come back in a while. Uh, I think those people in particular are going to be very surprised. You know, people have a stigma over the years. Ah, well, the place is starting to, to, to lose its luster. The place is starting to get run down. It's old. Well, okay, it's 100 years old. I mean, <laughs> imagine what you and yeah. I are going to look like at 100 if we even see that, right. okay? We're, gonna have, we're not going to be looking that great either. I, mean, I think uh, real fans understand that that's kind of part of the charm of the place, too. Sure. Um, Fairgrounds Aurora. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it looked oh, brand yeah. new, it wouldn't yeah. feel as nostalgic, yeah. right? But it, it, it looks like a brand new 100-year-old Fairgrounds, thanks, yeah. to, thanks to Orange Motorsports and Entertainment and... Uh, it, it is every race driver and race fan's dream come true, what is happening this year at Middletown. You know, this is stuff you lay awake at night in bed thinking about racing. It's like, <laughs> wow, would it be great to really have something super happen to that racetrack? Something super has happened. Yeah. <laughs> and and we're, we've got, we're paved the way. We're ready to go. It's phenomenal. Huge. Huge. So speaking of, uh, of Brett, so this year we're, uh, as part of the 100th celebration, we're going to do a greatest of all time tournament where uh, hand-selected legends from OCFS past will go head-to-head in a single elimination-style tournament, oh, wow. right? Wow. And obviously Brett's on there, and, you know, obviously Brett's record speaks for itself, but in something like a popularity vote like what we're doing, in terms of the greatest, not necessarily in performance, but in personality, in just track presence, just and, and overall popularity, I mean... Who do, you, who do you see kind of rising to the top, uh, you know, and is, is, is it really a done deal? Is it Brett, or is there, you know? No, I think you have a lot of drivers that know that track as good as Brett and have outperformed on, on, a, sh- on, a, on a shorter schedule. Guys like Tommy Meyer that can pull a rabbit from the hat on a Saturday yep. night in a 30-lap feature. Uh, guys like Timmy Hindley, uh, you know, come on, Jerry Higby, wow. Yeah. He knows that track. Yeah. And, and, and All these guys will be in contention for that title. And we're talking we'll see, great you know. personality, too. I mean, yep. true diplomats of the racetrack. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about, about Brett is, and this is, you know, 
the vote will take place on online on our Facebook <laughs> on cool. the website. That's and one cool. of the things about we know about the internet and social media is that the haters like to come out. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know, I think that that makes it an interesting it makes it an interesting race because Brett Hearn's popularity, you know, it speaks for itself. But will those haters come out in full force? You know, I mean, he's got to have more haters than anybody else just because he's got more fans than anybody else, you know? It's so true. But, you know, the bottom line is even the haters, you know, when you really sit them down and look them straight in the face, it's like, okay, look, he has been the team and the driver that has been a model for Northeast dirt track racing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and guys in small shops like this that, that only, you know, have a full-time job yet, go out there on a Saturday night and race against him. <laughs> He's been the model. He has set the precedent. Right. And he's shown a lot of drivers how to go about sponsorship, how to conduct yourself as a true professional, how to make your team look good. You know, not just the hauler in the car, but your entire team. I mean, his entire team was comprised of some very good people. You know, guys like Jay Casimore and stuff like that that had a great personality, conducted themselves well. I mean, they were a true representative of the sport as well. So he had himself, he, he, the model was set. Yeah. And we're so fortunate to be, to be living in that era where we witnessed this firsthand. Mm -hmm. you know, 50, 60 years from now, you're gonna, these guys are gonna be reading about this history books. Wow, what happened back in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s at Middletown? And this is gonna, this, this is history. We, this is just it. Sure, we're 100 years old this year. But every Saturday night, we write a new chapter in the history of that great place. Yeah. Every Saturday night. And, you know, people got to realize that. They're sitting in those grandstands. They are a page in the history of this, this phenomenal facility. So, Tim, I, I realized that I didn't even really introduce you. I kind of <laughs> just, we kind of just went right into this. Like, and, I, and obviously everybody that's an Orange County fan knows who you are. They hear your voice right yeah. away. We, we know it's, it's Tim Pitts, track announcer. The but, uh, so, so uh, Tim, you're track announcer at Orange County Fair Speedway, um, and as, as well as other speedways, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this is my actually 40th year doing racetrack announcing. Started when I was 16 years old and thought I would do this for four or five years, get tired of it. Always had an interest in local stock car racing. Dorney Park Speedway, Nazareth Speedway. Yeah, I've, been, I've, I've announced at a bunch of different racetracks here in the Northeast. Uh, last announcer ever at the Nazareth Half Mile Speedway. Uh, did that in uh, 1988 along with Middletown. Started in Middletown uh, in 86. So, you know, we're looking at... Uh, Year 34 at Middletown now. Uh, never in my wildest dreams thought that, A, I'd be there that long. B, that I'd still love it. Love it now more than I did when I first started. <laughs> uh, and C, when you start doing some numbers, you know, it, it shows age, that's for sure. It scares the living heck out of me to figure that over one third of the life of the speedway, I've been the, I've been the freaking announcer. Well, I it's like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> it's definitely a testament to how the speedway has persevered. You know, I mean, you and a number of other people are, have stuck around for so long, yeah. and I think that that's oh, yeah. that's obviously a big part of what's kept it around for a hundred years. We sat you know? last year one night uh, and figured out like who's been there. I think uh, I think we figured out that Roy Galuski came in. I think the year after I started. Sandy Brown is probably third in line. She's been there for so many years. Wow. And, you know, there are just so many people behind the scenes that would... We, we've gone through leaps and bounds. We've, we've made adjustments in our life to make Middletown yeah. part of our, our Saturday night. Maxwell's, you know? too. Sure. You know? oh, the whole Maxwell family. Yeah, and the fact that they're still around. You know? I remember Bob. I mean, he was a great yeah. guy. Very, very personable. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I still tease everybody about uh, you know, 1988 third year uh, cut my honeymoon short a couple days they'd make it back up for eastern states and, you know paid for that ever since but hey we're still we're still there hey there's here's a question how how do you how do you keep wives girlfriends etc vice versa happy as a, as a fan who maybe their spouse isn't as involved how do you get your spouse involved or uh, or how do you get them more on board with the lifestyle well it's going to be one of two things you know, there's going to be the, the A group where the spouses are involved, they're there every Saturday night, and they're a part of the scene, and, and for some reason, you know, they love it as much as, as, as the husbands do, or uh, vice versa. B, uh, I am fortunate. I mean, I've got a, <laughs> a, a, I've got a phenomenal family, a phenomenal wife. Uh, they understand that it's been a part of my life since I was, well, really, announcing since I was 16, right. racing since I was about four years old. 
you know, they understand that this is just something that. Because yeah. <laughs> you're, you're running a business, yeah, you know, yeah. and then and then yeah. also every Saturday night in the summer, you're, you know, you're up at the track. And yeah. Yeah. that's, you know, it's for all of us that work there, it, it, it can be a thing. And, and even for the fans that go every week, you know, how do you keep. Obviously, it's a great family event. You, you, know, you bring the kids, you it bring is. your grandkids. It's, but sometimes, you know, there's that wife, that that husband that just doesn't. They're not as into it, and they need uh, coaxing, or you know, you kind of have to yeah. trade. You can do one thing for them so that you can go out on a Saturday night and go to the races. Like I said, I am blessed that uh, even though my family might not be as, as crazy about the sport as I am, uh, they still allow me to do what I do. Uh, you know. I love them for it. I thank them for it. It's a great part to, you know, even if they don't want to come with me on a Saturday night, okay, I understand that. This isn't for everybody. <laughs> it just isn't. Yeah. It isn't. But I'm glad that I, I'm, I'm allowed to, you know, just to get out, do the sport, do it, do what I do, love what I do, and, and you know, come back home on a Saturday night and, uh, okay, you know, <laughs> back to the other side of the world, you know? Yeah. I'd have to, I'd have to keep my girlfriend in an in a enclosed box the whole time. <laughs> she would just, the amount of hair washing she'd have to do after that event, it would... It's not for everybody. It truly isn't. I mean, even you know, it's not. But yeah. uh, you, know. you got you got, you definitely have to love. You have to love the. Yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely ways to enjoy it without getting covered in dirt and and hearing sure. the sound. I mean, sure. there are box seats. There's, it, it, there is a way for everyone to enjoy the races, but it, to an extent, you have to love that. Yeah. Energy, it's, you know. For guys like probably you and I, it, it, I always, always use the phrase, it's a, it's a 12-step method that there's no correction. It's not a, there's, there's no correct, there's no 12-step method for this addiction. Right, okay? right. This is an addiction. There's just no 12-step method that's going to cure us for this. So give it up. <laughs> We're committed. <laughs> that's all there is to it. You know? So I guess that's the answer. It's yeah. just, it, really is. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, and in terms of like technology and taking advantage of that technology, what are your thoughts on live streaming? Because I know in, among some people, it's just kind of a, contentious belief that if you live stream races you'll reduce attendance and i i think no. it's totally misguided and wrong it very much is very yeah. much is here's the bottom line there's still nothing like being at that track right you can't there's replace that like experience it. it just you know there, there's nothing like being there and if you can't be there at least you can get on the computer and check it out and say you know right. what i wish i was there and i'm gonna make every effort i can to be right. there and if i can show it to someone who's never seen it before yes. at least that way you know it, it, it might excite them to the point that they have to go. You know, they see it and they say, oh, this is incredible. It's probably even better in person than it is, you know, and, and that's it, just another way to rope them and bring them into the track. The neat part, and I'm sure you've seen it, by looking at who tunes into this from all over the country. Yep. I mean, you've got people like, hey, where is this place? Hey, what, what, what do you do up there? Wow, that stuff's pretty cool. Yep. We have a plan a family vacation. We're coming to New York. So it turns, and, and face it, we're not losing fans in the stands because those no. people are, you know, West Coast people that have moved out of the area that still had a love for the track, right. they get to get back in there and right. get the juices flowing again. You know, folks like my own brother lives in Scottsdale, Arizona, loves coming back, loves going to Middletown. You know, he'll be tuned in every Saturday night. And there's no two ways about it. Yeah. So, no, there's, there's, you know, if you, if you lose, if you lose a dozen fans, you're going to pick up four dozen exactly. <laughs> by doing exactly. it. Exactly. And it, and it also exposes the sport to people on a national level, whereas, you know, you weren't yeah. getting them. It, 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 yes, it's a local track, and it's that's part of its appeal, and that's what's exciting about it, right? Is is like these guys we were talking about, local guys that are just legacies at the track, you know. And it, but someone out west, someone down south, it's it's just as exciting to watch, you know, as as a NASCAR event on television. Well, why why wouldn't you want why wouldn't you want to provide that for them, you know? It, it's even more exciting. I mean, well, I would say know, it's NASCAR's definitely more. Losing, I'm trying to be yeah. diplomatic here. Well, yeah, <laughs> like, the bottom line is, let's be honest. Yeah. No, it's I turn NASCAR on a Sunday and within 20 laps I'm sleeping. I'm, yeah. I, I just fell asleep. I can't watch it on TV. Uh, no, you know, I know. I can't this either. is exposing a race fan. Hey, look at what we do on a weekly basis. It's it's grassroots racing, but it's not what 99% of the people that have never been there think it might be. Right. You know, it's no longer just the uh, just the backwoods. It's no longer backwoods hillbilly moonshine running racing. No. It is not. No, it's definitely means. not that. Yeah. These guys are bringing three, four, five hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff to the track on a weekly basis, just in their haulers and what Pre they have inside. Precision engineered equipment. Oh, sure. Like you know, this isn't. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it, it's something that people that haven't been there need to pay attention to because. It's a different level of excitement than watching it on TV on a Sunday. And yeah. this is something where this is touchy feely. Right. You know, my, my, my big peeve with like IndyCar was always it's so out of touch. 
you and I can't get it, get our hands around this. We can't walk into the pits after. Right, the even races it and, even seems like the fan base is yeah, is yeah. on another level from way, us, right? Way. Yeah, we're we're here. This is something where the fans could go and enjoy the drivers afterwards. Can you know, uh, the yeah. drivers come over to the grandstands. I mean, stop. Oh, and back especially and, having the thirty first lap sure, and being able back. to have yeah. have a beer with the drivers sure. and the car sure. owners and you know, talk about talk about what you just saw. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. that's part of the experience that is like. It's unmatched. Second I mean, you can sure. you can watch a race on TV. You can call your friends after. You can go to the bar. You can watch yeah. it at the bar with your friends and talk about it. But to see it in person, yeah. and then you know convene at the bar and actually get to see the people involved, the the staff at the track, the drivers, you know, and just talk with all these people. It's it's an incredible experience. And you know, any local race fan has their favorite track. You know, we see drivers, we see fans. Like on a Friday night, I work at Big Diamond. And there are groups of fans there, there are groups of drivers you will never see anywhere else. Same thing with Middletown. Yep. And I think it's really time that we would love to try and mix and mingle. And we're hoping now that what we're doing at Middletown this year, we'll get some of these Saturday night fans and maybe go somewhere else. Yep. Friday night fans that might come. And, and actually, I, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing people at Big Diamond on a Friday night that are Middletown fans. Middletown fans coming down to Big Diamond on a Friday night. Yeah. That's cool. That's way cool. That's what you want. I mean, you know, we're not the only racetrack in the world, but right. boy, you know. Let, let's mix and mingle because you put them all together. You put them all together. We're gonna have standing room only, and right. every racetrack would. Yeah. Every racetrack would have standing room. That, that's what we want to achieve. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what about um, some of your favorite kind of memories in your 34 years oh, wow. here? Like, yeah. what is what has been kind of the biggest moment in your announcing career? There's been several. Uh, Right off the bat, of course, the two years we had Carl Edwards and Jack Roush come to the track, being able to, to uh, interview those two guys, and, and oh, really cool. just off-the-cuff interviews. Yeah. You know, trying not to do prepared, you know, nothing like that. No canned, yeah. no canned interviews. I don't like that. Yeah, uh, I think you and I are similar like sure. that. Yeah. That was phenomenal. Being, being able to rub elbows and talk with and, and see Buzzy Rudiman back at the track so many times. Uh, being able to announce... Fuzzy Van Horn's last feature win ever, last race ever. Yeah. That was way cool. <clears throat> and I think another, another highlight that really stands out would be uh, the night I got to interview Chris Economaki. Uh, in fact, well, that was many years ago. Uh, Chris was even, his health was starting to, to get to him and stuff. He had some trouble making the steps and all, and he was our grand marshal one night. Uh, and Chris Economaki came up. I actually had to go over to one of the VIP suites to do an interview with him. Mm -hmm. And in, in, the, in the course of the conversation, we stumble upon the fact that Chris was the first announcer ever at the Nazareth Half Mile Speedway. Oh. Well, I was the last announcer ever, <laughs> September 5th, 1988, read the eulogy. I was the last announcer at the uh, Nazareth Half Mile <laughs> Speedway. It's like, wait a minute, you get the first and last announcer ever at another historic track in the, in the, yeah. in the Northeast, and didn't even know it, sit there and have to, wait a minute, you gotta be kidding me. That's pretty neat. Stuff like that. Yeah. It's just been, you know, wow. so yeah, yeah. Milestones like that. and. Uh, did you see, uh, it was, I, I can't remember where, but Buzzy did an interview uh, recently. It was, it was written up in one of the, uh, some online news website for racing. And he mentioned that he was looking to run competitively at Orange County this year in, in the, uh, I think he mentioned in the champions race. Well, if there's anybody that could. Yeah. I mean, look what he did last year when he brought the, the UMP late model up. Right. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> he had us all on the edge of our seats. Age made no difference. No. He got around. Yeah. Uh, bottom line is this. I mean, put him in a modified, he'd still do the trick. He would still do the trick. Yeah, I think so. He really would. I think so. I hope he gets the opportunity. I'd love to see it. It'd be really, it'd be really neat. Yeah. I think it would really be. That, I think the fans would go nuts. Sure. I mean. If he could do the times he did in that late model last year, and there, now there's a car that was never on that track. Right. He was on, sure, he's a, he's, a, he's a fixture, but he would have never had that car on that track. Didn't take him a half a lap to get used to what was going on underneath <laughs> his feet. And boy, yeah. I'll tell you what, he was, he was turning some time. So how, in terms of like the track itself, how different, if at all, is the track since then? I mean, we made changes last year, I know, in changing some of the banking. So, I mean, it, it, it's not necessarily the same track that he had ridden on previously. He seemed to adapt pretty quickly, though, huh? Well, yeah, we started in the 80s. We had some banking. Then the banking got higher and higher and higher. And finally, some powers to be realized that, wait a minute, that's not quite the answer 
Right. You know, we're developing speeds here. The speed records were broken left and right, but it wasn't giving us good racing. Right. You know, uh, we had speed, but we had we had just too much one lane. The banking was not in our favor. So when they finally cut the banking back down, and we saw that that wall that we hadn't seen in 30 or 40 years, the racing got better, and it, it really gave these guys last two years a new playing surface and a, an equal level playing field they had to start over uh, I remember that when we first put the new surface down last year and Chuck McKee came back I said watch Chuck it's not the same racetrack you're used to mm -hmm. uh, and a couple guys that had taken some hot laps earlier said no you don't you don't race in anymore drive in race out don't race in you race in you're in trouble and a couple guys oh really and wow and they tried that when they drove in and raced out of those turns whoa they liked it and it gave us some, some two, three wide racing. We saw that. Yeah. And it also produced a setup where it wasn't just one or two drivers anymore that could race that track. We had any of a dozen drivers last year that adapted that new surface and adapted quickly and adapted well. Yep. So you, you put that to the historical aspect of what you're on. <laughs> you know, still is hard clay. Right. And, it, it, you know, it does turn hard in a hurry. But uh, it's a racy track. And anybody can't say it. Just look at look at the stats of any feature where a driver starts and where he ends, and how many cars he passed to get there. Yeah, you've got a dozen drivers that, mm -hmm. that learned that track quickly. Oh yeah, it performed. Yeah. So quickly. who's who do you think is going to surprise us this year? Who's uh, is it going to? Are we going to see? Uh, I mean, based on who we know is coming back, are we going to see the, a similar performance out of Anthony Perego there? Well, or, I mean, are we? Or is, uh, you know, yeah. who, who, who can kind of compete with him at this point? Obviously, all these guys can. Anthony is our modern-day Brett Hearn. Right. Okay, he's our 30-year our younger Brett Hearn. No two ways. And he's got it down pat. Yeah. I think we're going to see some surprises. I think by bringing, like, Timmy Hindley back, you know, he's, he knows it. I think we're going to see some, some real surprises from some regulars. Uh, these guys know that, boy, this is their year to shine, and this is their year to really get down to brass tacks racing. I think Tommy Myers is going to be back up on top. Yeah, I think there's uh, a good chance of that, too. I think, we, I think we can really see some surprises out of even guys like C.G. Murray, who, who have never run the track regularly for the last 30 or 40 years, right. but C.G.'s run the track regularly now for the last four or five years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he put some good, good equipment on the track. And I think guys like that are really going to polish their act and fine-tune their, their game plan. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, I think we'll see some surprises. Surprises in Victory Lane this year. I hope so. It's going to be cool. It'll be yeah. way cool. Yeah, I mean, just talking about, uh, you know, I know we've touched a little bit on the new purse structures. Obviously, that's the exciting news uh, this week. Um, how about that sportsman, that sportsman purse? I mean, you know, we drew, we drew over, uh, it was over 80 cars, right, for Eastern States last year. Yes, yeah, and, sports and we were States. slammed. I mean, Think about what we'll draw for that 100th anniversary race. It's amazing because even, even the sportsmen coming into that, that centennial race on, on Thursday night, they're coming with a $2,000 to win feature on Thursday night already. Yeah. You know, uh, the other thing, of course, look at, at the points this year too. You know, sportsmen, the, the, the championship fund now for sportsmen, 5000 to win the sportsmen uh, uh, championship this year. That's cool. Uh, even the rookie sportsmen will get a nod this year. But the weekly, the weekly purse for sportsmen, a thousand bucks to win every Saturday night for the sportsmen. Oh, baby, baby, this is going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah. they, they've never seen a thousand dollar paycheck. That was always a big event for them, a big right. purse for them. A thousand on a on a on a Saturday night to win every Saturday night, seven fifty second. You get back to fifth, it's still it's still four hundred bucks. I mean, in fifth place is what a feature win used to be. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's huge. It's it's huge. Even back to. As far as 19, it's still $100 to take the green. It's great. <laughs> this is great. So, yeah, yeah. the sportsmen are – and it's going to be a surprise because, uh, you know, I, and I know a lot of guys with sportsmen are, hey, what about the sportsmen? What about the sportsmen? Right. But guess what? They yeah. weren't forgotten about. It might be the best-kept secret all winter for the sportsmen, but <laughs> if you're thinking about competing in sportsmen, this could be your year because it is a, uh, it is a competitive division. Yeah. It's also an affordable division yet. Yeah. They're keeping their eye on it. They're keeping, you know, a good – Good and those, will do and that streets, the street stocks there. I mean, if you were on the fence about putting together a ride for a uh, street stock, uh, yeah. get, get on it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, $500 every Saturday night to win a street stock feature. You know, we were talking earlier. I remember back in the 80s, it was something how the, how the whole evolution of time happened with street stock racing. And we saw what happened with the pro stocks, too. I mean, they dwindled. 
the costs went up, the car counts went down. Back in the 80s, I, I turned to Will Kegel one Saturday night, he was up at our booth, he was our boss back in the 80s, and I said, Will, geez, come on, $40, $40 to win a feature <laughs> for street stocks back in the 80s. I said, Will, come on. Well, geez, oh, whiz, if we gave him 100 bucks, there'd be 500 cars here. He goes, we don't have time for that. Okay. Well, now we've seen the, and it's not just the Middletown, it's all over. The street stock classes have begun to wane down over the years. If you're going to build a street stock, $500 to win every Saturday night, 100 bucks for fifth every Saturday yeah. night, you know. And, and even the, the championship this year, we're giving these guys money for the, to win the championship. Uh, it's 2500 to win the street stock championship. That's never, that's never been heard of. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> if, you're gonna, if you want to get your feet wet in racing, if, if you're a brand new driver that's never been on the track before, whether it be a rookie sportsman or a street stock, here's your chance. Here's your opportunity to get your feet wet, maybe blaze some new trails and begin your career in racing. Here's the place you want to be on a Saturday night. It really is. Yeah. And, and to, to come into it on our 100th year, you know, what a special, what a special thing, you know? Boy. It only happens to, I'm not even going to say a handful of tracks across the United States. Uh, it's, it's only going to happen once. It will only happen once in our history. And how fortunate are all of us to say, even 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, you know, we're racing each other down the halls of, of, uh, of Happy Acres, uh, the retirement center, <laughs> in, in our scooters. Yeah, we were there for that 100th year. Yeah, we remember that. <laughs> yep. How many people are going to be able to say that? You know, they're going to read about this in, in history books. It, it's amazing. <laughs> but, you know, the bottom line is this. And it's happened at virtually every weekly racetrack, especially across the Northeast, where we've, gone, we've, we've fallen on some hard times. The roller coaster, boy, we've ridden that roller coaster for since the 80s. You know, we came in mm -hmm. the 80s, boy, the, the car counts were great, the fan count was great. In the 90s, early 2000s, a lot of tracks had trouble with car counts. Middletown never has had a trouble with open wheel car counts. We've right. been blessed with that. Uh, full fender, yeah, but open wheel, no. Fans in the stands, oh yeah, every racetrack has had that dilemma of putting fans in the stands. Mm -hmm. We're here, we're, we're, we're right back now. We're on top of the world. But what brought us to this point? Okay, I mean, back in the, in the 70s and 80s, we were fortunate to have guys like Len Donnelly, who really put Northeast dirt track racing where it is today. Mm -hmm. Guy like Len, God bless him. Man, I'll tell you, worship the ground he walks on. Great, a great promoter to work for. What a great personality and a true friend to every employee that ever worked for him. Uh, you know, that we had in the, in the 80s and 90s, you know, when, when Joanne Chadwick and and Corey Reed came on board. Yeah, we want to keep the place going. They did everything they could. They did a good job. They really did. Neither one of them had tons of funds to work with. You know, then we fell into the era of, oh, no. But, you know, honest to goodness, there was really nobody that wanted to take the lease of the Speedway. Yeah. And God bless Mike Gerda. I mean, you know, his family ran the fairgrounds. Uh, he had some experience in racing himself. He stepped up. And I think that was probably the roughest point of the racetrack to keep the doors open. And Mike did everything he could. And you know, I said it last year at Eastern States, thank God for Michael Goethe. You know, the, the hinges were rusty, the doors were falling off the hinges, but he didn't nail them shut. Yep. He kept the doors open, you know, and he propped them open. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the shutters were, were clapping, but they weren't shut. And if it wouldn't have been for him, we wouldn't be in year 100. Yeah. God bless the onslaught of Chris Larson and Halmar. I mean, you know, like I said, at Eastern States last year, you know, Mike kept the doors open and kept the, and propped them open when the hinges were rusty and falling off. Chris came in, replaced the hinges, gave us brand new doors, yep. and has, has just been our godsend. But we wouldn't be where we are right now had it not been the efforts of Mike through the lean years, who virtually did everything he could. People don't know what it takes to keep a place like Orange County on the map. No. They don't have a clue, you know, 100 employees on a weekly basis, and the overall expenses, you know, the taxes, uh, the upkeep, the maintenance, <laughs> it, yeah. it's huge. I mean, you know, if you're not in business and you don't realize what goes on behind the scenes of a typical business, 
Fans can't sit in the stands and say, well, he's making all kind of money. Uh, no, wrong. <laughs> you know, lucky he has a couple of coins in his pocket at the end of the night. Yep. So, yeah, we're, we, we've been blessed. The whole course of history of that track has been blessed to have the people it's had. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's Christmas this year. <laughs> Thank God for, for Chris and, and for Halmar and for the whole, the whole formation of Orange Motorsports and Entertainment. You know, Chris came in, Halmar came on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that they kept all of us. <laughs> yeah. And what a smart move to keep Michael on board. Yeah. Because, boy, I'll tell you what, it, you know, there's a guy that knows how to run a place when there's only a couple coins in the pot. So to keep him on there as well to run the place. Yeah, and, and give him the tools to actually yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. What a smart move. What a, what just a, what, what a game plan. What a perfect game plan on their part. Phenomenal. Last last uh, episode, we had Doug Dolgarian oh, on, yeah. who just joined the team uh, full time, who's uh, taking on a a ton of cool stuff. Uh, you know, putting together driver complete driver rosters, yeah. and we're now going to be working more closely with Steve at Program Dynamics Good. to put together some like really just great content in the program, and it's just going to be. You know, it, everything will be a celebration of our history, sure. where we're going, what we're doing, how we're growing, and you know, everything that, everything that's going on is going to be in that program. You're going to be able to just pick that up and see exactly what our next move is, and and what the next, what the next night of racing is going to be, giveaways, the schedule, everything's going to be right in there. And Doug has oh. done an amazing job of of he, he's doing all the all yeah. all the pre work to put all that together you know it, it's been uh, it's been great to have him on the team been a, been a big uh, big cheerleader for orange county all his life yep. been on the track been behind the scenes been an official yeah uh it's done wonders for us at our you know face it our our nostalgia night tracks envy what we do on nostalgia night it's yeah I without mean, it's, doug we wouldn't have done it we would not have done it steve barrett if, if people would know the history behind steve barrett i mean you know, at one time he produced uh, programs for, I think, up to eight or nine tracks on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I first met Steve late 70s, Dorney Park Speedway. I still have his programs. Thank God I didn't lose those in a fire. I still have those locked up in the house. And he has produced a great, great program. But there is a walking history book himself. Yep. And a great personality. Just, yeah. This guy's just great to sit down and talk with and to talk racing about. And yep. Great insight. I'd love. I, I got to get him on the show at some point. He's he's going to be a great guest. I Good mean, insight. Yeah. He, he and I sat down to talk. You know, plans for the year sure. and everything. And it, what a great conversation to just his yeah. knowledge and the history that he just he knows it all. He's yeah. What, a, what a source for just a I, great I, conversation and just great history. I've probably known him about almost forty years and. Uh, Really hasn't aged much either in 40 years. I don't know if he's at the Fountain of Youth down there in New Jersey where he lives or what, but... Uh, you know, I couldn't tell you. I haven't even reached 40 uh, years yet, oh, so... Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, my, my famous line from my father, getting old is not for sissies, and you'll find out. So. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it really isn't, but... Uh, no, I, I've, I've crossed, like, the first threshold, so it's, <laughs> you know... <laughs> well, you know, I guess I Adul Adulthood is... Scary. The, yeah, it's, it's that, that feeling of no longer growing now you're degrading yeah. <laughs> well i guess i get the scooter ready for happy acres because we'll all be uh, we'll all be burning up the hallways one day <laughs> yeah um, how speaking of uh track time there have have you uh have, how much time have you spent in a car behind the wheel on the track uh not enough to be any good <laughs> <laughs> well you know it began as as a offshoot hobby a haphazard hobby years ago i I had the chance first to pick up uh, one or two cars from the old Doherty Park Speedway where I first got interested in racing back in the late 70s. Then I had the opportunity to pick up the car that I helped build, which was which was considered the Batmobile of Doherty Park. Okay? Oh, okay. Unfortunately, we lost it in the fire, but boy, I'll tell you, that was just one beautiful race car. So I started getting into the vintage car collecting. Car City, here was yeah. a 1980 point champ at Doherty Park Speedway, okay? And then one year, uh, crazy as it was, I found myself racing in the uh, dirt asphalt division at Mahoney Valley Speedway. Wow, pretty cool. Loved every minute of it. Uh, spent a ton of money that I didn't have. <laughs> okay, and at the end of the season, my, my crew chief who built the car, who was also involved in ARCA racing at the time, said, hey, I'm heading down south. He goes, take that, that dirt asphalt car, 
uh, put a rear clip on it, put a vintage body on it, and go have some fun at some real tracks where you'll get more speed, more enjoyment, and spend a fraction of the money. So lo and behold, took it, put a gremlin body on it, uh, old, old late 90s Olsen car, and went to a bunch of different tracks. Grandview, uh, Big Diamond, had my only win at Big Diamond Speedway. Uh, Bridgeport, wow, you know, New Egypt, went all over those places with this, this vintage car, had a great motor. Um, you know, unfortunately, we lost the car and the motor to fire, but the, the motor was built by David Van Horn Sr., okay? Wow. Uh, he's building one for me now again, it's great. He builds an awesome motor. Built it all out of used parts he had laying around. Hmm. And one fast piece, great motor. And lo and behold, yeah, we wound up at Middletown. And oh, I'll tell you what, I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, it's like Daytona, it's like being in Indianapolis. To be at Middletown and racing that track and uh, lost out to Stan Wetmore, the only guy that robbed me of my only win at Middletown was Stan <laughs> Wetmore. And you know, me racing against Stan Wetmore, King of Lebanon Valley, that's yeah. like racing against Brett Hearn as far as I was inside that car. It's like, you know, had uh, I think two laps to go and he got me off of four for the checkered. And uh, still finished second, best finish ever at Middletown. Phenomenal, just neat. And you know what? It's a shame that every fan in the stand don't have that opportunity because it is something like you cannot even describe in, in sitting here. You can't describe what it's like being inside of a race car. Yeah. Nothing like you think of. I guess probably the highlight, though, the absolute highlight was uh, taking a, a car around for about 20 laps in Syracuse. Uh, they had the driving experience back then. Uh, Glenn had a couple of a uh, couple of those those uh, spec cars he built, mm -hmm. and one year at Syracuse we uh, we offered rides. There was a two seater. Uh, we offered rides that night, and then uh, we also had some driving experiences with those those uh, spec cars. And they were just basically crate motors, yeah, uh, small block sportsman cars. And at the end of the, uh, I helped stay. Help, I was announcing that night at, at Syracuse, and at the end of the night, uh, I helped do the whole driving experience that night. And the first thing, we advertised the ride-along by putting me in the second in the two-seater that afternoon for the small block show at Syracuse. And Todd Milton was the driver. Todd had worked on a lot of those cars. And we had a, a, a intercom, a wireless uh, intercom set up inside the car. So I got to announce inside the car. Wow, that's cool. You know, screaming all the prayers you learned about as a kid to set them a whole <laughs> lot faster. And I think we sold 90 rides that instantly that night. So I stuck around that night, helped everybody in and out of the car, stuff like that. At the end of the night, Todd goes to me, hey, he goes, you know, we really can't pay you. But he goes, uh, you want to take a couple of laps? Heck yeah! <laughs> in the car I went. I think I took about 15 laps that night. Wow. And you talk about the ultimate experience. Coming off of two, it was getting a little bit greasy. The lake effect was setting in. Going down the back stretch at Syracuse, seeing the campfires of people sitting there, roasting wieners and stuff like that, and watching it, it's like... Hmm. You hit the big time. You hit the big time. <laughs> screw Daytona, screw Indianapolis to take a couple of laps at, at Syracuse. You know, yeah, that was as big as, as running Middletown. But yeah, we've had we've had. I haven't been able to get out on the track for about two years now. Uh, we got this old Bicknell car sitting here that we bought from a guy at Grandview, ran it in Sportsman Division. Really didn't twist it up that bad. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll try and get a motor in that, and we're designing a body, so we'll try and get some track time again this year. Maybe not as much as we used to, but we'll try and. We'll try and get the Moo car back out of the pasture and resurrect some, uh, some good times back on the track. Well, Tim, it was awesome uh, talking to you. Thank you for having me at your shop. Thank I you. Mean, what a cool place. I said uh, you're probably the first person in 34 years that's <laughs> made a two-hour trip from Middletown to, to see my neck of the woods down here. In, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think it was uh, well worth it. Well mm. worth it. And we'll, I'll have some pictures of uh, Tim's cars and his shop up on the site sure. along to go with this uh, podcast. To. So you guys can kind of get, get an image of... of Tim's shop and what you know what we sat around here while we had this conversation. I think it's, it's I mean it's a beautiful shop. And, it didn't uh, come easy, you know. Devastating fire a year ago. Uh, thankfully, I had enough insurance to rebuild the shop. I did not have enough insurance to uh, to replace what I lost. Uh, Thirty years worth of possessions I lost. Uh, so yeah, it's a nice shop. It's empty, <laughs> and you know what. <laughs> Uh, I lost a little bit of energy in the whole deal. It's, I'm not going to fill it back up. I'm happy with what I have. I'm not looking to replace the 30 years worth of contents that I lost, but it could have been worse. It you get to make new memories, yeah, and it's, you know, that's it's, kind of... It's not my home. It was not my family. I'm thankful, yeah. I'm thankful to God for that. It, it is what it is. It was a game changer. It changed my view on things in life. So I just try and pull the positive out of it. And yeah, I'm just thankful that I was smart enough to have enough insurance to replace the building. 
just not smart enough of it to replace the content. So yeah. it is what it is. Well, you, you heard it right here from Tim Pitts, track announcer. This is a public service announcement. <laughs> Ensure your belongings. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> believe it or not, race cars, race car parts, truck parts, and car parts are not included in your normal insurance policy. Somewhere in your policy, there's going to be the terminology land use motor vehicle. That applies to race cars. <laughs> Some solid advice. Ugh, so take it, take it from a man who's lived it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hard way. <laughs> well, thank you again, Tim. Has, thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Can't wait to see you at the track once we get going here in April. Love it. Love it. Next thing is the motorsport show. That's going to be a real kicker. That's a real shot in the arm. Yep. That gets the blood pumping. We'll see you there. I'll probably make you sit down for a second and have a, have a couple minutes uh, chat with me there at the show if you're going to we'll be, be around. We'll be at your we'll disposal. Be, we'll be recording at the show. So. We'll be at your disposal all weekend. Great. Love it. We'll see you there, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.